Okay, so our topic today is going to be an introduction to trust and estate taxation. Now, clearly in a, in a one to two hour class, we're not gonna be able to go in great detail on some of these things, but this is just an introduction to the concept. So if you haven't ever dealt with trust or estate taxation or you're fairly new to it, then this, you know, this course will take you through some of the basics. If you have, it's a good refresher just to kind of remind yourself of what of what the uh, basic concepts are. And so that's going to be our main focus. So we start looking at some of the, some of the um, goals for the segment, what we want to learn and understand in this course. First of all, we want to differentiate between trust and estate and income taxation versus estate and gift taxation. Now they sound like the same, they're not, they're different, uh, different concepts entirely. And so at the beginning, we're going to discuss how those are different and cover a little bit of income taxation of trusts and estates, but generally the focus is on estate and gift taxation in this, in this particular segment. Next, we want to articulate the basic framework for gift taxes and the most commonly applicable credits and exclusions. We're not going to cover all the credits and exclusions, um, and there's a lot in this area of law, but the most common ones, the most well-known ones, and the ones that are going to apply in most cases, we're going to cover those. Next, we'll identify the basic estate tax framework, including applicable credits and exclusions. So uh, point, bullet point two is the gift taxes, bullet point three is the estate taxes. We're essentially doing the same thing for both. And there are a number of similarities and important relationships between the two, and so uh, we'll cover that as we get in. But that's another segment goal. Lastly, we want to determine what assets are included in the taxable estate and calculate a basic estate tax liability. We're also going to do a basic gift tax liability today. So uh, this is, this is our, our segment goals for today, uh, just to gain a, a preliminary understanding of how these taxes work. So first, it's important to start with the definitions. The estate and gift tax um, it, it contemplates two different types of tax. First of all, there are, there are several different tax topics um, based on whether the tax arises from income or a transfer of property. And so we have income tax on trusts and estates, and that's the taxation of the income from the assets held in trust or by an estate. This is a more classic income tax concept. The idea of the income tax on trusts and estates is basically that trusts and estates, uh, it, bl it blends a lot of the different concepts, flow through taxation, like partnership tax. Um, they're taxed in some ways as a separate entity, almost like a corporation. In some ways, they're a disregarded entity. And so you borrow from a bunch of different areas of the tax law from taxation of entities in the trust and estate taxation income concept. And so income that's within an estate or a trust is typically going to be taxed at the estate or trust level so long as the, the income is not distributed. So if the income over the year accrues and it's added to corpus, then one of two things are going to happen if it's disregarded entity, which is called a, a granter trust, uh, and, and you don't have granter estates. But if it's a granter trust, it's taxed like a disregarded entity, and the person who created the trust is going to be uh, receiving the tax effects from that income. Otherwise, if it's not taxed like a, a disregarded any entity or grant or trust, then you'll actually tax it within the estate or the trust if it accrues and it's added to corpus and it's not distributed. Alternatively, any income that is distributed is going to be taxed almost like a flow-through entity. or, or it's, it's not going to be double taxation like a corporation because you won't tax it at the estate level and then tax it like a dividend to the people who receive it. The way it's going to work is the, the actual underlying tax consequences of that income are going to be recognized by the individuals who receive that income. So you have this distributable income concept. So that's just a very ancillary overview of the income tax on trusts and estates. And again, this isn't really an income tax, uh, con tax course for trusts and estates. It's really just a, we're really focused on the next topic. And that's the estate and gift taxation. So estate and gift tax is actually an excise tax on the transfer of assets from an individual estate or trust based on the value of the assets transferred rather than a tax on income. So this is an entirely different concept. We're now taxing 
the assets themselves, the underlying principle, the corpus of the trust is being taxed. That's the idea, and it, trust or estate. Um, and it's also the underlying corpus of the, of the property that's being transferred in a gift. And so a get, estate and gift taxation is really focused on those transfers. That's why we call it an excise tax, not an income tax. The income is taxed separately under the income tax concepts. So within this realm, you have gift taxes on gifts, estate taxes on what are called bequests. That's when you receive an inheritance, it's a bequest. The person giving it, the person, well, not giving it because they're now deceased, but the person's estate that's making the transfer is bequesting uh, property to a third party. And then you have generation skipping transfer tax on transfers to grandkids and other uh, non-first generation descendants. So these are, the, these are the big picture taxes. So we're going to be focusing in, in number two today. That's really the main focus of our, of our topic. But uh, before we get into estate and gift taxation, there are some general definitions that are, are worthwhile to know. Um, it's, this is really essential in understanding some of the language that we're going to be using throughout the, throughout the, the topic, the segment today. So first, you have estates. Uh, and estates are essentially the assets that were previously owned and not in trust by a person who is now deceased, the decedent. And these do not autom the, these are the assets that do not automatically pass by operation of law. And these will be included in the estate of the taxpayer. This is a state law concept. So the estate of an individual for estate tax purposes is actually much broader. But when we're talking about state law estates, uh, this is when we, we have this process where we appoint a personal representative and, and often called a PR, or in some states it's called an executor, but it's the same idea. It's the fiduciary that's going to gather up the assets, pay the liabilities, and distribute the assets of the estate to the heirs of the estate. And this whole process is called probate. So probating assets or probating a will is essentially appointing a personal representative to gather up the assets, pay the liabilities, and distribute the assets. Now, the state concept is different from the tax concept, and we'll get into what a taxable estate is and a gross estate under tax law, but it's important to note that these are different concepts. An estate under tax, under state tax law, is really focused on getting the assets that are titled in the name of somebody who's deceased into the names of their descendants. So that is a completely different concept. So you have assets that pass outside of an estate. Uh, for instance, let's suppose you had a taxpayer and their wife, and together they owned a joint checking account. Well, when somebody dies on a jointly held checking account, uh, then typically, assuming it's not a tenancy in common, which wouldn't usually happen with, with cash accounts, then, then what happens is the surviving individual ends up owning all of the assets. You don't need to do a probate of that cash to transfer the, the title or the, the ownership of that cash from the decedent to the new individual because it happens by operation of law. When one person dies, the other person automatically just remains the sole uh, owner of that cash. And so that would not be included in the estate under tax law, or excuse me, under state law, but it may be included in the estate under tax law. The estate under tax law is more concerned about what actual assets the owner owned and then transferred. Uh, tax law is less concerned about avoiding have, having a, a, a deceased person be, have the assets titled in their name. Tax law is more concerned about the underlying uh, facts and, and actual circumstances of, of the transaction. So it's important to keep these two concepts separate. So here we're talking about an estate for tax, for state tax purposes. Next, we have a trust. And a trust is an arrangement through which a trustee takes title to property for the purpose of protecting or conserving it for the beneficiaries. And a trust involves three key parties. You have a grantor. This is also known as the truster, the donor, the settler, or the grantor, again. And this is the party that transfers property to the trust. And generally speaking, the grantor is also the party that, that set up the trust and established the trust. That's not always the case because there are times where you have 
a, a person whose assets are transferred into a trust by a court. And so the court may establish the rules of the trust, uh, but generally speaking, in 99% of the cases, the grantor is also going to be establishing the rules of the trust and, and setting it up. Next, you have the trustee. The trustee is a fiduciary who is responsible to manage the assets of the trust according to the trust agreement. And so fiduciary, they have responsibilities to preserve the assets of the trust, to manage the assets in a responsible way. And there's a whole area of the law related to fiduciary duties and, and what those responsibilities are. Lastly, you have a beneficiary, and this is the party entitled to the income and or property from the trust, whether the income or remainder or only a contingent beneficiary. So it, in, in this case, it, when we talk about remainder interests, that could be an interest after a period of time. Uh, sometimes when you have like a life estate, for instance, somebody will own property for their life and prior to dying, they can give away a remainder interest, which means as soon as they die, that interest automatically transfers. Once again, that's something that would transfer outside of a state, ta of a state estate, but not necessarily something would transfer outside of a tax estate. So you also have contingent beneficiaries, and that's essentially somebody who would take if a beneficiary is no longer living. If the, the, the originally designated beneficiary is no longer living, you'd have a contingent beneficiary. You could also have t contingent or subsequent trustees. Um, once again, just a concept for planning ahead, just in case. And a lot of these trusts are set up for multiple years. Now you have income taxation. The general idea for the taxation of income for estates and trusts is a hybrid of flow through in any taxation where the income is taxed the recipient thereof, whether it be the trust or estate itself or a beneficiary or heir. Or in some cases with what are called grantor trusts, the grantor actually receives the income tax uh, results um, from, from the, the income within the trust. Next, I want to look at timing of gifts and estate tax. So now we're changing gears and again. We're, now we're focusing on estate and gift tax exclusively from here forward. So unlike income tax, which resets every tax year, estate and gift taxation is based on the gifts and bequests made over the lifetime of the gifter or decedent. The gift and estate tax regimes are combined under a unified tax rate and unified credit. You know, we have this concept called the taxable gift or estate, and this is a little bit confusing. There are certain exclusions and deductions that apply to gifts and bequests in order to arrive at what is referred to as a taxable gift or taxable estate. This term is somewhat confusing because a tax does not necessarily apply since the unified lifetime credit and some other deductions are applied against any tax on taxable gifts or estates before any actual taxes due. So when we say a taxable gift or a taxable estate, we don't really mean a taxable gift or a taxable estate. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a tax on it. Um, it's, it's more of a term of art. And we'll see how this plays into the, the estate and gift tax calculation here. It's, it's actually an unfortunate um, concept. And fortunately, um, well, like I said, it's, it's a term of art. It doesn't necessarily mean a tax applies, and we'll see why later. You have something called the unified tax credit and exclusion amount. This concept can be a little bit confusing, so I want to talk through this and take my time getting through it now, and then you'll see how it comes out in the calculation. The unified transfer tax credit applies against taxes on a taxable gift or taxable estate and functions to exclude or exempt the first $5 million of taxable gifts or taxable estate per person as of 2012, or excuse me, 2011. And then this $5 million amount that's excluded is adjusted for inflation every year. So it's $5.34 million in 2014, $5.43 million in 2015. It was between 5 and 5.34 in 2012 and 2013. So this, is, this, is slowly, this amount is slowly going up each year based on inflation. The credit amount is the tax um, that, that would otherwise apply to the excluded amount. So this credit amount, um, it, it isn't a $5 million credit. What it is, is you apply the credit after you calculate the tax. So remember, looking at the, the, the bullet point above, we had what was a taxable gift or estate. We apply the tax rates to that taxable gift or estate and then come up with some amount for the tax owing. And then we apply the credit, which is 
it's really going to be the tax rate times $5 million. So it's going to be less than that because you're applying it as a credit after the tax calculation has been made. So sometimes you'll hear reference to the unified tax credit, and that'll be some amount between 1.7 to $2.5 million, depending on which year it is, because again, the, the amount is adjusted for inflation. And that's the unified tax credit. And then other times you'll hear about the exclusion amount, which is about $5 million and change. And so the reason you'll hear those two concepts is because when you actually do the calculation, you use the unified tax credit amount. But the idea behind the unified tax credit is that it's going to exclude or exempt about five million and change in tax in in uh, principle of gifts or estates that can be transferred so that's the concept of the unified tax credit or the exclusion or exemption amount once again all these terms a little bit confusing but the underlying idea it's it's more the concept that you need to understand then you have the tax formula while the tax is based on all gifts and bequests made over the lifetime of the gifter and decedent gift tax returns are due annually so the formula, and, and annually, so long as there is a taxable gift, of course. So there, you don't have to file a gift tax return every year. You just file one whenever you have a taxable gift. And at times, there may be reasons for filing one even when you don't, but the um, point being you don't have to. So the formula for calculating the tax incorporates gifts made, taxes paid, and credits applied in prior years. So we've got this kind of hybrid where, yes, we're doing this annually, filing these returns, but the idea is that we want to take the lifetime gifts into account. This is, this is really the idea behind this tax concept is that we're going to tax you on your lifetime gifts and your lifetime estate, uh, estate transfers or bequests all together and apply this unified credit to that. So over the, the course of your life, you, you have at least, in, in 20, as of 2015, $5.43 million that each individual can give away without incurring a gift or a state tax liability. And, and that's, that's the idea. Now, we'll talk about some ways and other, other exclusions, and the annual exclusion is, is an important one. But we'll talk about some different ways that these, uh, that you can actually give a lot more than that, and in fact, significantly more, uh, immensely more, if you utilize your, your annual exclusions uh, properly and um, some of the other preferred tax ways of transferring assets. So we'll talk a little bit of tax planning at the end, but I want to just focus on the, on the basic principles at this point. So now we want to look on to what the actual formula is, and I'll use the, the gift tax formula to kind of explain the concept of estate and gift taxation. So I've put together a formula that actually combines both gift tax and estate tax, because in reality, they're calculated very similarly. Now, there are some features that are specific to gift tax and some features that are specific to estate tax. But overall, the formula is basically the same. It's just you, you have to change some different things at different steps. So just going through the formula really quickly, you're going to start with the gifts transferred. And, and there are special rules that apply to determine whether something is actually a gift and whether something is actually included in what's called the gross estate. Now, this is the taxable, uh, this, is, this is gross estate under tax. And so it's different from the state concept, the state law concept of estates. But in this case, you're, you're taking something, a concept called the gross estate, and we'll cover that in more detail later. And then you're going to back out what's called the annual exclusion for gift taxes. And for estate taxes, you'll take out estate exp expenses. Estate expenses are kind of the, the types of things you would expect um, them to be, like you know, costs for the trustee or, or personal representative. Uh, you've got administrative costs of the estate, commissions on sales of assets, and just a number of things fit into that estate tax expenses category. Um, also, importantly, one of the big things for estate is expenses is you have liabilities. So you'll be, oftentimes you'll include in your gross estate the amount of assets and then the liabilities, particularly unsecured liabilities, will come out as a state in, in the estate expenses. Now, if you have a liability or if you have a mortgage that's secured by a property that's in the gross estate, then oftentimes you'll reduce that 
and just just report the net equity amount. But if you have liabilities that are unsecured, then they would go in the estate expenses. And often, sometimes you'll even put mortgage amounts in the estate expenses and, and report the total amount of the of the property. I'm not going to get into a great amount of detail on that, but I, I'm just pointing out that there are liabilities that show up in the estate expenses. Less, you're also going to back out marital deduction, uh, and, and that's an important factor, and it applies both to gift tax and estate tax. Um, you're going to back out charitable deductions. Uh, once again, um, gifts and, est and estate bequests made to charities are not going to end up being taxable, so you'll take them out as a deduction here. And you end up with call what's called the taxable gifts or the taxable estate. Once again, there isn't necessarily even going to be a tax on your taxable estate or taxable gifts, but this is this is a term of art, and it basically means your your gifts transfer to your gross estate less your exclusions and, and deductions. Next, you're going to add in your prior taxable gifts because, again, this is this is looking at all of the gifts made throughout your life, uh, and estate taxes paid or your gift in estate bequests made throughout your life. So, of course, if it's an estate, you're not going to have prior estate tax um, in this case. So you're just looking at prior taxable gifts at this point. Adding that back in, and that gives you your tax base. Then you're going to calculate your gift tax before credits. And in the estate tax concept, it's called the tentative estate tax. And you're going to do this using the applicable gift and estate tax rates. Now you're going to back out any prior gift taxes paid. Once again, if you're going to add in prior taxable gifts made, you should also get to back out any prior gift taxes paid. And then you're going to back out your unified credits. And for the estate tax, you'll take any credits that are applicable, which include the unified credit. And the unified credit's the biggest one. It's the only one we're really going to focus on in our class today. And this gives you the gift tax due, or in the case of estates, this is the estate tax due. So there's your formula, estate and gift tax formula. Now, the rest of the course, we're just going to be adding really meat on the bones of this calculation so that you understand what each of these steps are, at least preliminarily. Now, there's a lot in here. There are a lot of different concepts. And then we'll talk quickly about planning and generation skipping tax. So let's look first at the gifts transferred or the gross estate. In this case, the amount of the gifts transferred is determined based on the principal the, the principal is set forth in IRC sections 2511 to 2519. And then the concept of the gross estate is a concept that is defined in IRC sections 2013 to 2046. So that's what we're refer referencing to in terms of, of defining what these principles are. And so for gifts, while the concept of a gift may seem fairly intuitive, there are actually a number of requirements that must be met for a completed gift to have occurred. A gift occurs where a competent donor with donative intent actually or constructively transfers an asset to a donee for less than full consideration, and the donee accepts the gift. Now, there, typically there needs to be some kind, of, um, some kind of donative intent as well. So, for instance, if somebody wins the lottery, they didn't receive a gift. What they received was actually income because the lottery was paid out by a company the company didn't pay them because they liked the person. The company paid the lottery fee out because, or it could be a company, it could be a government entity. But they paid it out because they used the lottery as a way of generating revenue because they earn more money from the tickets paid in and than they did pay out at the end usually. Or they may have used it for promotional purposes. So in lieu of paying a bunch of money for promotion, they may have been generating a generating buzz about a product using a lottery or a raffle or something along those lines. So really with gifts, what you're talking about is somebody who has donative intent. So it's somebody who's, who's doing something for somebody else. Usually it's a family member where you're giving money to family members um, out of love or disinterested generosity is what the, the standard is often used in, in court cases. So it, once again, lottery, winning the lottery or winning a raffle is not receiving a gift. It is receiving income. That is different from a gift. Now, also you have incomplete transfers, such as where the donor retains the right to reclaim the property or transfers a future interest, and these are not gifts. So that's an important concept because oftentimes 
uh, you'll see this in, in practice and in reality. People will give gifts, but they retain the right to take the gift back. They might give the gift in the form of the right to use a property, but not necessarily transfer the actual property until after their death. Well, if they didn't transfer the actual property, what they may be gifting them is the, simply the right to use. And the gift amount may be the rental value of that property before the gifter dies. And then at the death of that gifter, that would then be included in their estate rather than pass outside of their estate as a gift early earlier. So there are a bunch of rules, and it's interesting because there are actually um, instances where you would think the motivation of Congress would be to have things count as a gift, when in reality, a lot of these rules prevent things that otherwise look like gifts from being counted as gifts, and that forces those particular items into the estate of the individual who was gifting them. Now, there is another concept called imputed gifts, which is important. Um, this often arises with below market loans, which result in income tax to the creditor, as well as gift tax consequences for the difference between the market interest rate that would otherwise be charged and the actual rate charged on the loan. If there's no reasonable expectation of repayment, then the entire loan might be deemed to be a gift. So this is not uncommon. Individuals will give uh, loans to family members and charge zero interest. And what ends up happening is the IRS is going to look at that and they're going to impute interest at market rates. So let's say you give a zero interest loan to somebody. At, for, you're, you're thanked for doing that by being imputed interest and deemed to have gifted that interest. It's actually a double negative in tax parlance because you get interest income that you don't actually receive. And then you gift that interest income to the recipient who has the zero interest loan. And so it's, it's both an income tax consequence and a gift tax consequence, and both of them are negative. So below market loans uh, result in, in these imputed interest and, the, and this imputed gift. And there are other instances where you might have imputed gifts where, for instance, if you sell a property well below market, uh, maybe the property is worth $200,000, you sell it to your niece for $120,000, well, you probably just made an $80,000 gift to your niece because the underlying uh, economic consequences of the transaction are that you sold it way below market and the only reason you would have done that is because it's to a family member otherwise you would have wanted to recognize the the gain on that property so so this is the concept of gifts so gifts transferred once again it's it's it, it can be a little bit complex in terms of what is actually a gift but in most circumstances it's pretty straightforward you can imagine somebody gives something to somebody they know and love. That person receives it, accepts it, and you have a gift transferred. So now let's con consider the concept of the gross estate. The gross estate is, is really all property that is subject to the federal estate tax upon the death of an individual. This is different from the probate estate under state law, which is all assets held in the estate, or in other words, assets that are titled in the name of the decedent after the decedent's death. So this difference is particularly pronounced as it relates to assets that transfer as a matter of law incident to the decedent's death, such as jointly held accounts, life insurance proceeds, and payable on death accounts, etc. And assets held in trusts, such as revocable trusts and grantor trusts, are also passing outside of the, the, the state law estate. But those assets may be included in the gross estate depending on the circumstances. Now, typically, if it's a revocable trust or a grantor trust, then it's going to be included in the estate of the the the, the settler. Um, not always, and and I'm this that an analysis of what trust assets are included in the estate is is beyond the scope of this course. There are a bunch of regs and code sections on that, um, but the idea is is generally that if if the the decedent had control over that property at the time of their death um, then or just prior to it of course then it's generally going to be included in the gross estate and that's that's just a, a general rule of thumb it doesn't once again there's a whole bunch of specifics as to uh, making that analysis that are beyond the scope of this course but i did want to point out that that's the idea behind the gross estate now you have adjustments to the gross estate as well that where you're actually going to pull some assets into the gross estate that are not actually included under the general definition. So in addition to the assets held by the taxpayer at the time of death, 
certain adjustments must be made, including one, gift taxes paid on gifts within three years of the taxpayer's death, two, transfers where a life estate is retained, three, transfers taking effect at death, four, revocable transfers, and five, life insurance proceeds. So these are all items that may not be, um, you know, included under the, the gross estate general definition. But these particular items are gonna, gonna, going to be brought back in to the gross estate. And so essentially you're starting with the estate under state tax law and then you're adding these items back in. So the gross estate ends up being far more expansive than a state under, under state law. So that covers gifts transferred and the gross estate. Now let's move on. We've got something called the annual exclusion and estate expenses. And we want to take a, take a look at these two concepts as they're, they're fairly important. So the annual exclusion for gift tax purposes permits each individual to give up $14,000 each year per, per donee every single, every single year. So it's annual. The idea is that you can give this money, and it's almost like a de minimis exception. You can give $14,000 to, some, to somebody or $14,000 to multiple somebodies without any gift or estate tax consequence. And you can do this every single year. Uh, additionally, and we'll talk about the marital deduction in a minute, but you also have a marital deduction, which means that you can give an unlimited amount to, to your spouse without any gift or estate tax consequences. So because you can give something to your spouse and your spouse could then give that property uh, to a third party, there's this concept called the gift splitting election. And that permits taxpayers to deem gifts made by a married person to any third party to be from both spouses, which essentially doubles the amount of the annual exclusion for married taxpayers. Uh, you can see rather than being required to transfer an asset to your spouse and then have you give somebody $14,000 and have your spouse give $14,000, you can file this election and just say, look, we're doing a, a gift splitting election and we're deeming the, the, the exclusion to be doubled. And so when you, you do gift splitting, you can get a, give a pretty significant amount of money away to each person a year. You know, in, 20, in 2015, you're looking at $28,000. And again, this annual exclusion, it's adjusted for inflation in $1,000 increments, and it started out $10,000 in 1997, and it's adjusted for inflation back to 1997 based off that $10,000 amount. So we've apparently had 40% and change inflation since, since 1997. So that's why the, the annual exclusion is $14,000. As soon as we approach uh, a 50% inflation from 1997, it'll go up to $15,000, and that will continue to go up um, with inflation. Now let's look at estate expenses. Estates may deduct certain expenses, including administrative costs of the estate, professional fees, commissions, funeral expenses, and court costs, debts of the decedent, and casualty or theft losses incurred while the estate is being settled. So these are all the different expenses that that you can take against the estate. And some of these are more significant than others. Um, professional fees, uh, commissions can be really significant, particularly if the uh, owner of the estate, excuse me, the, the personal representative of the estate decides to liquidate everything and pay out things in cash. And that may be required. For instance, you might have the most significant asset within the estate might be 80% of the estate and it could be real property, a piece of real property. Well, if you have five beneficiaries, there's no way to distribute, or at least there's not a clean way to distribute that property to multiple beneficiaries. So oftentimes properties will be sold when they're in the estate and then cash will be distributed. And so that's, that's really why you have these estate expenses taken against it, which makes sense that you would. Now we're going to back out the marital deduction. So the marital deduction is an unlimited deduction. And all gifts and bequests from one spouse to the other are entitled to an unlimited marital deduction, meaning those transfers are excluded from estate and gift taxation altogether. 
So the, the spouses must be legally married under state law, and that's the only real requirement for applying the unlimited marital, de- marital deduction. And uh, in the past, this has not included same-gender couples, but this was actually uh, the, the primary issue where DOMA was overruled was based off this unlimited marital deduction and whether it applied uh, to a couple that were of the same gender. And the Supreme Court said that it, it, it should apply in that instance to same gender couples. And so from now on, the IRS has taken the position that as long as the spouses are legally married under state law, they'll be entitled to the unlimited, unlimited marital deduction. And that's something that changed recently. That was just within the last you know, two, three years. So that's the unlimited marital deduction. Now you have a charitable deduction, and donations to charitable organizations are not subject to gift in a state tax and are awarded a special deduction to ensure uh, that this is the case. Also, this deduction is not limited based on the taxpayer's AGI, as is the case for charitable donation deductions taken against the taxpayer's income tax. So, for instance, when you make a charitable donation, if it exceeds 50% of your AGI, and we're assuming this is a public charity and a cash donation, then you're going to be limited. You can only take up to 50% of your AGI in the income tax realm. But here, in estate and gift taxes, you don't have that same limitation. There is no AGI limitation. So any charitable donations you make um, as a gift or pursuant to your estate are going to be not subject to gift and estate tax. It's going to be removed. You have a charitable deduction against your gross estate or gifts transferred in the estate and gift tax realm. So this is an unlimited charitable deduction uh, that that applies in this context. So next, we, we, we sum those up and that gives us our taxable gifts or taxable estate. Once again, term of art. Um, you need to be careful and make sure you understand uh, what we're saying by that. And then we're going to add in any prior taxable gifts. Now, since the unified credit is a lifetime credit, we need to add back the prior taxable gifts in determining the tax base and then subtract out the unified credit amount against all lifetime transfers to determine the tax base. Taxpayers also get credit for prior gift taxes paid since the taxpayer generally can only die once. They will generally never have a prior estate taxes paid line. I say generally because I guess, you know, there might be instances where somebody's declared dead because they've been missing for a long time and then I don't even know what the IRS is going to do with that person, but uh, the rules apply for people who only die once. So then we calculate the gift tax before credits and tentative, and it's called the tentative estate tax in the estate tax side by using the applicable gift and estate tax rates. And then we're going to back out the prior gift taxes paid. Like I said, you get credit for that. And we're going to back out our unified credit or other credits for estate and gift taxes. And that'll give us our gift tax due. Okay, so now we're going to illustrate these basic concepts of estate and gift tax through the use of an example. And I find it helpful to go through examples and, and, and explanations of these concepts because it's one thing to talk about them definitionally, and it's quite different when you actually have to run the calculation. And I think going through the calculation is particularly helpful uh, just for understanding these concepts. So let's start out. We have uh, we're going to start out with problem one, and this, this will be the application of the gift tax. So we're starting with the gift tax world. And here's our little set of facts, and we're going to use this uh, same concept all the way through uh, a gift tax uh, calculation as well as an estate tax calculation. So we have Bob, who's a high wealth individual who makes several gifts during 2012 as follows. First, you have Bob transfers $5 million cash to his wife, Selma. Second, Bob transfers stock worth $3.5 million to his best friend, David. Third, Bob transfers $3 million in cash to his daughter, Wendy. And four, Bob transfers a remainder interest in a $4 million condo to his son, Carl, and retains a life estate, which means the condo belongs to Bob until he dies, and then title transfers to Carl automatically upon Bob's death. Carl's interest is actually called a remainder interest in this case. So we're going to assume all of Bob's taxable gifts from prior years were $4.3 million, 
and Bob paid $300,000 in gift tax on gifts from prior years. And we want to calculate Bob's gift tax due using the gift tax formula in this case. So these are our facts, these are the various gifts. Just a couple of quick comments. So our first step is going to be determining which gifts were actually transferred. And, and this is going to include everything uh, with the exception of the life estate. That, so the, the, the $4 million condo is not going to be deemed a gift in this concept, in this, in this case, because uh, Bob's retaining a life estate. Now, you can retain rights in certain gifts, and, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of how much of the asset needs to be transferred in order for it to be determined a gift. But just as a, as a general concept, if you retain a life estate um, in, a, in a particular asset, then it's not going to be deemed a gift for gift and estate tax. So Bob's going to transfer remainder interest in a $4 million condo to the son Carl. That's not going to be included. Pretty much everything else will be. So the, the, the $5 million cash to the wife, the $3.5 million to his best friend David, and the $3 million to his daughter Wendy. All three of those gifts, those significant gifts, are going to be included in the gifts transferred. So that'll take us to this next section. Again, I'm just using the same formula we used before, crossing out the estate tax, because in this case we're doing gift tax. So you have gifts transferred, and the amount is, the total amount of those three gifts is 11.5. Again, we're not including the $4 million gift to Carl because he retains a life estate in that gift. Then we're going to back out our annual exclusion. And I took out 52,000 here. So really, what the way I ran this calculation, there's two ways you could do it. So you've got your annual exclusion and your marital exclusion. I only applied the annual exclusion to the non-marital gifts because I didn't want to take it out as an annual exclusion to the wife and then reduce the, the amount gifted to the wife, the, the, the marital deduction by that amount. You could do it either way, get, get it the same number. But I just applied the annual exclusion to the two gifts. One, remember, one gift to his best friend David. So I applied a $13,000 annual exclusion for David. I also applied a $13,000 annual exclusion for the daughter Wendy. The reason it's 13,000 not 14 is remember this is the 2012 tax year that these gifts were made. So we're looking back to 2012 and back then, based off inflation, the amount of the annual exclusion was 13,000. So we have a $13,000 exclusion times two. Now we also, since he is married, because we know he's married, right? Because uh, he transferred some money to his wife, uh, Selma. And so we know that he's married, assuming he's legally married, then you get a split interest gift and they can make a split interest election and they certainly should do that in this case so instead of it just being 13,000 times 2 you end up getting 13,000 times 4 and so what you're essentially saying is that Bob gave 13,000 to Dave uh, under the annual exclusion he, he gave another 13,000 to Dave by giving it to his wife and having his wife give it so that gets him uh, uh, you know 28,000 uh, or excuse me uh, he gets 26,000 in, in annual exclusion for the gift to David. And then he gets another 26 for the same reason, same method for his gift to his daughter, Wendy. So your total ex annual exclusion is gonna be 52,000. Like I said, I'm not worrying about the gift to Selma at this point because the very next line is gonna be the marital deduction. Now you could have taken another, another uh, 13,000 in annual exclusion to the wife, but then you'd have to back that out of the marital deduction because you'd be double dipping. So I just put it all in the marital deduction Marital deduction is essentially that the entire amount of the gift given to the wife, which is $5 million in cash, is going to be deducted. We're going to back it out. So we do include it as a gift transferred, and then we exclude it under the marital deduction for $5 million. And that then, then we're going to back out any charitable deductions, which in this case there weren't any charitable gifts made in this particular year that we are aware of. And that gives us taxable gifts of $6 million. $448,000. So that's your, your taxable gift. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll be taxed on it, as we've discussed before, but that's where you start. Now, I did mention in the fact pattern that Bob had taxable gifts from prior years of $4.3 million, and he paid $300,000 in gift tax on gifts from prior years. So you've got prior taxable gifts of $4.3. We're going to add those in 
to our tax base, and our tax base is going to be 10.748 10, uh, 10 million. Now we have to calculate the gift tax before credits using the applicable rates. Now we haven't really talked about the, the rates, the tax rates for estate and gift tax. Uh, beginning in 2013 and through 2015, the tax rate is basically, a, it, it functions as a flat 40% tax on the portion of the estate and gift, uh, the portion of the taxable gifts and taxable estates that's actually taxable you're going to end up with basically a 40% tax, and it's, it's essentially flat. Now, if you look at the tax rates, it doesn't show up as being flat. It, it shows up as a progressive tax rate that starts between zero and a million dollars. And so you have this, this progressive rate. The first dollar that's taxable is taxed at some rate below 40%, and it works its way up to 40%. Um, but you have, because of the unified credit, you aren't ever actually going to be taxed on that first million. You don't actually start getting taxed on your taxable estate or taxable gift until you get over the $5 million and $5 million and change uh, lifetime exclusion amount. And so that being the case, there's this progressive tax rate that's completely uh, inoperable. So once you get over $5 million, everything's taxed at 40%. So a better way of thinking at, of, about it, even though technically there is this, uh, this progressive tax rate, a better way of thinking about it is basically that you're going to be taxed on, at 40% on everything over $5 million and change. That's just the way it, it's going to work on your lifetime gifts and estate uh, donations. Um, of course, we are excluding annual exclusion gifts and marital deductions, and there's charitable donations and such. There are a bunch of exclusions, but in, in terms of your actual taxable gifts, uh, the extent that your taxable gifts exceed uh, $5 million, you're going to be taxed on it. That's, that's the idea. And that tax rate is generally going to be 40%. Now, back in 2012, it was actually 35%. So we're going to run the calculation at the 35% level. I do a little shortcut rather than calculating it on the whole amount and going up all the way through their brackets. Uh, the unified credit, as I mentioned before, is equivalent to the tax on that first $5.1 million. So since the unified credit in 2012 was $1.7 million, we know that the tax on the $5.1 million, the first $5.1, going through the progressive tax brackets on the first, the first million dollars, that tax is going to be $1.7 million. So a quicker way of calculating this would be just to take the amount over 5.12 million, again, this is 2012 numbers, and multiplying that by 35%. And then you'll just add in the amount of your credit and that gets you your tax. So we're gonna do it that way. It's an easier way of calculating it, um, but you just intuitively need to understand what's going on. So the calculation is 10.7 million. We're gonna back out the 5.1, the excluded amount and that'll give us the 5.628 million. Then we're going to multiply that by 35% because we're in 2012 here. 2013, it went up to 40 and it's been there since then. And so that 35% is gonna be 1.969 million. We're gonna add in our 1.7 million and that gives us a tax on the tax base of 3.742,600. So this is the total tax on the full 10 million. Then we're gonna come back in and subtract out that unified credit. But first, we need to back out any prior gift taxes paid. So we get credit since, since this tax base represents all the gifts and estate uh, transfers made over our whole life up to this point. And in this case, it's just gifts. Um, we're going to back out any gifts taxes paid and we're gonna back out the unified credit that was effective at that time. So that gives us a gift tax due of $1.669 million. Well, it's basically $1,669,800 is the, the specific calculation here. Good, so that's, that's, that's our first gift tax return. And this is conceptual, and there are a lot of details if you're actually doing a, a tax return that, that go beyond the scope, and, and there are additional complexities that we haven't covered. But at least at a conceptual level, this gives you an idea of how the, the gift tax is, is calculated. So let's move on now to the estate tax. So now we're going to say, uh, apply the same facts and answers problem we'll have to, answer, to, to the answers in this question. 
So in 2013, the very next year after the, the facts in problem one, Bob dies and his will directs that a third of his estate after expenses should go to his wife, Selma, a third should go to his daughter, Wendy, and a third should go to the Cancer Foundation, a public charity and 501c3 charitable organization. So uh, apparently, uh, I don't know if the prior gifts went to Carl or what's going on, but for whatever reason, he didn't give money to Carl. Sorry, Carl. Life's hard all over, but hopefully you'll take some solace in your $4 million condo. So Bob's total assets upon his death are $91 million, and the expenses of his estate are $1 million, which are mostly professional fees and probably costs of uh, selling. Uh, well, we'll just say the professional fees. Since I'm a professional CPA attorney, I'd love to charge somebody a million dollars. Not really love to charge. I'd just love to get paid a million dollars. That would be awesome. Anyway, so there it is. So we'll say they're all professional fees in this case. Um, so there's our fact pattern. So the first part we're gonna to need to do, now we're no longer looking at the gifts transferred. Our first step is gonna be look at, looking at what our gross estate is. And clearly we have our 91 million, and the, we don't worry about the million in expenses because that's taken out later. So the gross estate will include all of those assets, that full 91 million. And then we need to look, are there any other assets that are going to get pulled in? And if you recall, uh, when he made the gifts in the prior year, you had Carl, who transfers title. Um, Carl was given a life estate, or excuse me, a remainder interest in this condo that's worth $4 million. And we did not include that in the gift tax at that time. Because what happens is that is actually included in the estate tax when Bob actually dies. So in addition to the 91 million that are included in Bob's assets um, after his death or in his estate upon his death, we're also gonna need to include that four million from Carl that was given to Carl before. So we're gonna add $4 million to the 91 to get ourselves up to $95 million. Also, um, one other thing we're gonna add, and if you remember, there's a special rule for gift taxes that are paid in the prior three years. So we had two sets of gift taxes in our example. Uh, one of them were gift taxes paid prior to 2012, and that was $300,000. And the, then the other were the gift taxes paid in 2012, which is 1,669,800. That was the, the answer to problem one, really. That was calculating the gift tax due. So, now, if that three hundred thousand was within the paid within the last three years, then you would you would include that as well. We're going to assume it was not. I probably could have put that in the question, but um, this will help us calculate it. We're just going to assume the three hundred thousand was paid. You know, this is twenty thirteen, so we'll assume that was paid in two thousand and nine or two thousand and eight. And given the fact that the prior gifts made were four point three million and the prior gift taxes paid were three hundred thousand. Um, you can see that, that it, was, it was likely uh, prior to 2010 that, that that gift tax was paid. But if you didn't get there intuitively, I'm giving you the answer now that that, that was paid before. So our three-year clawback rule then is just going to pull in the 1.6 million, uh, 1669800 that we calculated on gift taxes for 2012. So our, we start out then with a gross estate, when you add those up, the 91 plus the 4 million plus the 1.6 million, you're going to get 96 million 669 and 800 dollars. The next step is we got to back out the estate expenses. In this case, the expenses are fairly simple. We just said a million dollars in professional fees, so we're going to back that amount out, and 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 that'll come out of the out of the uh, the total and getting to the taxable estate. Now we also get a back out of marital deduction, right? And so we gave a third of the assets to the spouse. Now remember, what we're talking about is a third of the assets that remained after expenses. And so we aren't taking a third of the 96 million. Remember that 96 million includes $4 million in, in a condo that was transferred uh, outside of the estate and includes a million dollars in expenses and it includes 1.6998 million in in expenses, or sorry, not expenses, but but gift taxes that were paid in the prior year. And so, really, our base is 90 million. 90 million is what the estate actually had to distribute to the heirs. So each of them are going to get 30. So when we decide the marital deduction, 
remember it was split into thirds. One third went to Selma, one third went to Wendy, and one third went to the Cancer Foundation. So we're going to immediately back out our marital deduction, which is going to be $30 million. That's the $30 million that was paid to, to Selma. Next, we take out our charitable deduction. Once again, it's another 30. It's another third of that 90 that we're going to back out. And so that gives us a taxable estate of $35,669,800. Now we need to add in any prior taxable gifts. Now, this is going to come from, from two locations. And essentially, it's going to be the taxable gifts from 2012 plus any prior taxable gifts preceding 2012. And this is going to be the same number as the tax base we calculated in problem one because we add those two amounts together to get our tax base for problem one. So our prior taxable gifts is going to be $10,748,000. And then this gives us our tax base for our estate tax of $45,417,800. And then we need to calculate the tentative estate tax using applicable rates. Now we're going to use the same steps we used before when we were doing the gift tax. I'm going to once again, we're going to, we're going to take the the amount that's subject to the exclusion, back it out, and then multiply it by the applicable tax rate, and then add back in the credit amount, which is the tax on the, the, the five million and change that, that is excluded. So in this case, we've now advanced to 2013, so we have different tax rates, we have different exclusion amounts, and so the tax on the first 5.25 million is 2,045,800. Again, that's using a progressive tax rate on the first million and then basically a flat rate of 40% on everything thereafter. So this is the same as the credit amount. And the marginal tax rate on all amounts exceeding 5.25 million is 40% in 2013. So now we run our calculation. The calculation, we take our 45 million, we're gonna back out the first 5.2 million, 5.25 million, which represents the exclusion amount. That gives us 40,167,800. Then we're going to apply the 40% tax on that, to, and, and that gives us a tax of $16 million. And then we're going to, we're going to add back in our exclusion amount of two, or our credit amount of $2,045,800 to get a total tax on the $45 million of $18,112,920. Now you could also arrive at this amount by going through and figuring out the, the tax at each rate on the first million and then doing a flat tax of 40%. On the amount over 45 million, or excuse me, on the on the the amount in excess of that million. But this is this is kind of a shortcut way of getting to the tax rate. So we get 18112920. Our next step is going to take prior gift taxes paid. And remember, we had the 300,000 that was paid prior to 2012. We had the 1.6 million paid in 2012. That gives us 1.9 million and change. So prior gift taxes paid of 1,969,800,000. We get, we get credit for that at this stage. Then we get our unified credit amount. Now remember in 2012, this unified credit amount was 1.7 million. And the reason being the tax rate at that point was 35%. Now we have a 40% tax rate. So the tax rate went up between 2012 and 2013. And so the credit, the unified credit, and the excluded amount still the same. So the unified credit amount went up. It went up incident to the tax rate. It also went up because this amount is adjusted for inflation. And so our unified credit amount is now larger than it was before, and we're going to take it against this total tax. So we're recalculating everything based off current, uh, the current numbers. And that gives us an estate tax due of grand total $14,097,320. So that's our, uh, that, that concludes our, our calculation portion. And there are a number of things you can learn along the way in terms of how this calculation functions and, and how things are taken into account. But there are some big picture items as we look towards tax planning strategies that are worth noting. So first of all, uh, reducing the estate tax using the annual exclusion is a critical element to any tax planning strategy. In 2014 and 2015, the annual exclusion amount is $14,000. From our example, it was 13. That's just because it hadn't inflated its way up to 14 yet. But by using this amount and applying the split interest gift election, a married individual can give $28,000 every single year to as many other individuals as the person wants. 
Now you can imagine if, if a couple have four kids or just even four people that they want to give their money to, that's over $100,000 every year that a couple could give without it even getting to the point of affecting their, their unified credit. So their unified credit could hold firm at $5 million and they could give $100,000 million or 100000 away every single year and have no tax consequences whatsoever, virtually none. So that's a big part of planning. Now, um, it doesn't seem like a huge amount when you're talking about somebody with $100 million, but if you think about this as every single year you're giving $100,000 away, plus you're getting those assets out of your estate, which means as those assets appreciate over time, you're getting that $28,000 per person every year plus the interest on it, plus the appreciation on it, plus any income on it. It's all getting out of your estate. And so those amounts can really add up of, over time. If you think about it in the terms of like a, a, a retirement plan, if you were putting $28,000 into a retirement plan every single year and you had the time value of money over the lifetime of that plan, you could imagine that that amount resulting in a tremendous amount of assets in that retirement plan. And the same principle is going to apply here. You're going to transfer it tax-free to two other individuals, those individuals, assuming they don't spend it, maybe they will, um, are going to get the appreciation on those assets over time, and it's passed through tax-free. So this ends up becoming much more significant, especially if you have a lot of people you want to give your money to, and you have time to give it away. If you're already in your 90s and you're likely to be dying soon, maybe you won't be able to utilize this nearly as much. But if you're a high-wealth individual and in, in this in his or her 30s then and you already have your children or you already know where you want to give your money then you can already start making these gifts and it it can be very effective at getting huge portions of your estate out next i want to look at discounts for transferred interests in companies this is another uh important piece to the gift in estate tax planning puzzle so individuals will often optimize their annual exclusion amount by placing property into a company and gifting minority ownership interests in the company with severe restrictions on the sales of those interests. This strategy permits the gifter to significantly discount the value of the interest. These are called minority interest discounts and lack of liquidity, liquidity discounts, respectively. And what's going on here is you can imagine, let's suppose a, a person gives $100,000, a $100,000 property, into a into a uh, an LLC, so they're they're going to put this this property worth one hundred thousand dollars, or even let's make it larger. Let's make it a million dollars. We'll put a million dollar asset into an LLC. Now you can we'll say there's a hundred ownership shares of that LLC asset. So each ownership share is worth approximately ten thousand dollars. Well, if you look at it and you say, okay, how much is and that's that's on a on a liquidation basis. So you can look at it and say, well, how much is one percent of this LLC worth? If all I own is one percent and I'm not allowed to sell it or otherwise encumber that one percent in any way, shape, or form. Well, if I only own one percent of an LLC, clearly I'm not going to be able to control it. I'm not going to be able to make any investment decisions about it, and I have a restriction on on whether I can even sell my interest. Um, now, those types of restrictions are going to make that asset worth less than the pro rata share of it. So originally, you would say, this is a $1 million company, I own 1% of it, therefore my 1% should be worth $10,000. Well, it doesn't work that way when your 1% is not entitled to any voting rights, is, is non-transferable, and... Um, and you really don't have a lot of control over, in fact, there, there might even be some negative tax consequences because if it's an LLC, it's a flow-through entity. So the income earned in this company could create phantom income. And so it's it's been recognized by the IRS that the value of this may be less than the actual value of the LLC, the, the pro rata value. And when you reduce it, that's called a minority interest discount and a lack of liquidity discount. And I've seen um, cases on this where people try to reduce it by 80, 90 percent. So they say that this one percent interest, even though the assets in the company are worth, would be worth ten thousand dollars, 
they say it's only worth a thousand dollars maybe well that's a little bit aggressive and and courts aren't going to uphold that type of liquidity and minority interest discount but it'd be very common for them to uphold something more like 25 percent each and so you could get about a 50 percent discount total and maybe even more um, again it's a case-by-case -case basis facts and circumstances are taken into account but you can get a pretty significant discount so what you can do is you can let's say we take a a 60 percent discount on this because of minority interest and lack of liquidity which is a little aggressive but um, it, it may fly so if you take a 60 percent discount on the ten thousand dollars in 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 uh, llc interest then you're going to value that at four thousand dollars so you'll get one percent at four so you, you could then, if you've got an annual exclusion amount of 14000 you could give 3% of this company, which might otherwise be worth $30,000, and apply the discount, and you get it in at 12000 And then you gift that. So you're gifting these minority interests, and that's, that's a really common strategy that's used, is, is using discounts on transfers of interest within companies. Now, there are a bunch of limitations. The IRS might apply the step transaction doctrine if there isn't any legitimate business going on. Um, once again, there, there are a number of perils in this, but I'm just giving you a very high level look at, at what the games that are often played. So you look at that and say, OK, well, now instead of just transferring uh, 14,000, I'm able to transfer more like 30 or 40,000 in assets per use the split interest gift and now I'm transferring more like seventy to eighty thousand dollars in assets per year per person and so you can see how that those numbers can add up really quickly plus any appreciation on that asset that million dollar asset over time is going to now accrue within the estate of somebody else and not your estate if you're the high high wealth individual uh, next, you've got maximizing lifetime gifts. So there are a number of ways that tax law favors lifetime gifts over bequests. First, since gifting sets the value of the gift as of the date of the gift and the unified credit increases with inflation, gifting earlier provides a double benefit of gifting property at a lower value, assuming the property appreciates with inflation, and it permits the gifter to make additional gifts in the future as the lifetime credit increases over time. So what, what am I saying by that? Well, first of all, let's assume you gift you know, it's your first year, you just became multi multi-millionaire, and you gift exactly the amount of the lifetime unified credit, plus the, the annual exclusion. So you're gifting 5.2 something million dollars, just the amount, the maximum amount that you can gift tax-free. So you've now used up your entire unified credit in, in year one, and your, your uh, annual exclusion for that year as well. So in theory, all money that you then gift after that in, a, in excess of the annual exclusion would be taxable. But in this case, it's actually not going to be because the unified credit, your, your gift amount, the amount of your gift is locked in time on the date that you gifted it. So as property inflates and inflation occurs, your unified credit amount is going to go up, which is going to give you more room for gifting in the future. But... Your, the amount of those gifts will not be deemed to appreciate, will not be deemed to go up with inflation. So your, the amount of those gifts are locked in place at the time the gift is made. So by gifting over your life, you're essentially able to avoid that appreciation and your credit's going to grow and permit you and give you more room to make tax-free gifts in the future. Plus, you'll have annual exclusions that are available every single year. The next way you maximize lifetime gifts. The next reason that's important is the asset is used to pay the gift taxes. The assets that are used to pay the gift taxes, excuse me, are excluded from the, the gross estate unless those taxes are paid in the last three years prior to the gifter's death. So estate taxes, on the other hand, are not excluded from the gross estate. So you figure out your gross estate amount based off your assets, you get your tax base, and then you apply your tax rates to that. You do not back out the taxes paid from your tax base. But you can see if you pay gift tax in prior years, that's going to reduce the amount of your gross estate. And as long as it wasn't within the last three years, it's going to reduce your tax base. And so you get kind of a double benefit from that in a way because it, it reduces your, your assets transferred upon death. And so maximizing lifetime gifts 
reducing the state using the annual exclusion and applying discounts for transferred interests. These are, these are some of the ways and some of the most common tax planning strategies to where people, uh, estate and gift tax planners can really help, well, help, can really uh, uh, avoid the estate and gift tax all the way around. And so these are really important strategies, um, particularly if you have clients where their assets exceed. Um, really, if, you're, if, if the assets of a client, and, and we're assuming a married client, exceed you know, six, seven million dollars, they really need to do some significant, they need to start to consider at least some significant tax planning strategies because the tax rate on that amount over 10 million is going to be extremely high or over 5 million per taxpayer, but if you have a couple, they get two. And so this tax rate is 40% on the amounts over that. So a lot of, a lot of people would be interested in, in doing some tax planning to avoid um, these types of taxes. So one last concept before we leave the tax planning strategies is a concept called portability. And portability is that the deceased spouse's unused lifetime credit can be used by adding it to the surviving spouse's lifetime credit upon his or her death. So what are we talking about here? This is two spouses. The first spouse dies. And perhaps the first spouse dies before they've done enough gifting and estate uh, bequests outside of the, the marriage to uh, utilize the entire unified credit for that individual. Well, the concept of portability permits any unused credit to be given and utilized by the surviving spouse whenever the surviving spouse dies. Now, once upon a time, uh, trusts were required. I say once upon a time, it wasn't even that long ago. Um, a few years ago, trusts were required to uh, accomplish this. So if you wanted to preserve that, that credit that um, belonged to the first spouse to die, you had to utilize a trust to, to do this. And so there are millions of trusts that were created solely, or at least primarily not solely, but primarily for the purpose of achieving the goals of portability. Anytime you had somebody who was, you know, had assets combined that exceeded the unified credit amount, um, you would, you would want to do a, a trust that permitted these transfers. Now you have this concept of portability. It happens automatically. Uh, it makes sense that it would be the case uh, if, if everybody is able to do this through a trust, why not just allow it to be done uh, as a general rule? And that's what's done now. So this is a good thing. It was a good tax law change that was made about four or five years ago. I believe it was 2011 or 2013 that this was implemented. But this is the law now. And so uh, the deceased spouse's unused lifetime credit is going to be utilized by the surviving spouse. So the, this $5.2 million uh, exclusion amount is really more like a $10.4 million exclusion amount as long as you're married because you and your spouse can plan together and um, utilize uh, portability to stack those two credits on top of each other when the second spouse dies. So that's the, it's not really a tax planning strategy per se. It used to be, but now it's just a function of the tax law that exists that you need to be aware of. All right, so our last topic uh, for today is the generation skipping transfer tax. Now, there's not a tremendous amount that I need to say about this. Um, it, this is a complex tax, and it's important for you to be aware of, but... It's a little bit beyond the scope of this course to get into the specifics of how the generation skipping transfer tax works. I just want you to know more or less when it applies so that if you have an instance with a client and you're doing estate and gift tax uh, work and you notice the client uh, gives money to a potentially generation skipping individual, then you need to know and look into these rules a little bit more carefully and understand how they function. So the idea behind the generation skipping transfer tra tax is this prevents avoidance of estate and gift tax from direct transfers to later generations, later generations being grandkids, great grandkids, etc. By assessing additional tax, by assessing the additional tax that would have been paid if transfers did not skip each generation. So what are we saying? What, what are we trying to avoid here? Well, think about it this way. If a person gives $25 million to their, their child, well, 
five million of that's going to be excluded under lifetime under the the unified credit maybe 10 depending on if they're married but a pretty good chunk of that is going to be taxable now so you give 25 million you're going to pay your whatever 10 million or 8 million or whatever it is on that that particular transfer then you can imagine that son not spending all that money and then giving 20 million to their kid and once again they're going to be taxed on that so they're going to have a pretty healthy tax bill on the on the the 20 that's passed on to the next generation so an adult uh, or or a giver might look at that and say well i know that a good chunk of this money is just going to go to my grandkids anyway why don't i try skipping a generation so instead of giving 25 million to my child and then having 20 million of that go on to the next generation how about i give 10 to my child and give 10 to the next generation and maybe even five to my great grandkids the, the the generation after that and so by doing that at least in theory you would then only pay the estate tax at one level now generation skipping transfer tax comes into play in that instance and that is where you have those levels of taxation that were avoided end up being applied now there is a generation skipping a uh, generation skipping transfer tax exclusion and it's similar to the estate and gift tax exclusion where you have a lifetime exclusion for for these what are called direct skip transfers and so when you have a direct skip instance um, preferably it's something that will come in under the exclusion and you won't have to face generation skipping transfer tax there is some planning that goes on here and this is a huge oversimplification of the GST but I'm just providing it as a, a basic concept and con a basic conceptual framework so that you can understand more or less when this would apply. So anytime you have transfers to a skip generation, you need to take generation skipping transfer tax into account and make sure that the, the tax doesn't apply. Now, since it's a 40% tax at each generation, GST ends up being 40% plus 40%, which is an 80% tax. And it's exclusive of the amount transferred. So if you make a $10, 000, a $10 million taxable transfer to a, a grandchild, uh, your tax rate on that could be $8 million. So this is a brutal, brutal tax. And you want to make sure that it does not apply when you're, when you're setting up uh, gifting and estate tax uh, decisions. And generally speaking, well, I'm not going to make general statements. I just want to want to point out that this is a huge red flag that you need to watch for anytime there's a direct skip. All right, so that concludes our class uh, for today um, on trust and estate taxation. Um, just hopefully this has been helpful for you in, in understanding the underlying concepts. Of course, this is just an introduction, but it does... Uh, give a pretty thorough um, explanation of the basics for trust and estate taxation and uh, hopefully it'll uh, if you if you have to deal in this area it will train you in some of the lingo and some of the, the the verbiage that's commonly used and you can understand these concepts a little bit better and and that's it thank you